Good morning. Well, uh, I get those hugs. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to have 70 degree weather uh, and a nice weekend away. So I guess those hugs come uh, with a lot of um, credit that you've, you've given. So thanks for welcoming us. Uh, we had a great time at the Coca-Cola Museum, drank a lot of Coke, and watched a lot of fish yesterday. Uh, so we've been having a good time. I might as well embarrass them since you already did, Jared. So uh, my wife Nancy and my girls are here this morning at 11 a.m. So can you give a little wave? Well, I thought I'd introduce myself some more. Uh, one of the things you should know about me is that I love students. Uh, I've been doing student ministry for over 20 years now. Uh, InterVarsity is one of the two largest campus ministries in the US. We're at uh, over 1,000 different chapters and college campuses across the country. Prior to this role, I directed the Urbana Student Missions Conference, which is the largest student missions conference in the world. Uh, we're expecting over 16,000 students this coming December uh, at Urbana 2018 our missions conference. Now, one of the things you should also know about me is that growing up, I never dreamed of being a missionary. I never thought I looked like a missionary. Uh, in my home, the one thing I was never taught was to be a missionary. I was taught instead that missionaries were strange people with nothing better to do with their lives. I was taught that missionaries were only for the super spiritual, you know, the Marvel superhero Christians, right? I was taught instead to pursue the American dream, a white picket fence home with 2.5 cars and 2.5 kids. My parents, they came from poverty in Asia, so I wouldn't have to live in poverty in Asia. But as a college senior at the Urbana Student Missions Conference, God captured me with a vision much bigger than that American dream. He gave me a vision for the world. He showed me something that I would give my life for. And I said, yes, Lord, whatever your mission is, I'll do it. Years later, God eventually uh, called my wife and I uh, to start a Christian student movement in the country of Mongolia. And ironically, we found ourselves living in poverty and in Asia, right? <laughs> Mongolia was a, was a Buddhist country. Uh, prior to 1990, there were no known Christians in the country. No Christian history. The first Bible was translated in the year 2000. It's a country with 3 million people and 33 million herded animals. And besides all that, it's a cold country. Negative 40 degree winters that last eight months long. And we were living in California at the time. So we cried out to God, can we actually survive here, God? How did we end up here? As we nomadically move through life. Have you ever asked that question? How did we end up here? This morning, we're going to look at a character in the Bible who probably asked this question, and he sees God's vision for the world. So let's look again at Genesis 12. This passage is often known as the first great commission. I'm going to read again in the New International Version. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So in this passage, God calls Abraham, and he essentially says, I have a mission for you. I'm going to create a new nation, the people of Israel. And you're going to be the founder and CEO. I want you to leave everything, your home, your, your culture, everything you have. And then go somewhere unknown, somewhere I'll eventually reveal to you. Then God makes an interesting promise. In verse 2, he says, I will bless you. Notice the word bless and blessing is repeated in this passage five different times. It's a threefold blessing. First, it's a material blessing of real estate. God will give him the land that he's prepared. Second, it's a family blessing. God will give him countless descendants. We know later in Genesis, God promises Jacob as many descendants as the sand and the sea. And thirdly, it's also a spiritual blessing, that God will forever be with Abraham's descendants. Of course, God eventually gives the outward sign of circumcision 
to represent this. It's a sign of this promise. But the question for us this morning is, why does God bless Abraham? What are his purposes? Let's look back at verse 2 again. What does God say? I will bless you and you'll live a happy life. Or I will bless you and you'll have all the friends and fame and followers you've ever wanted. Or I will bless you and you'll have your white picket fence home, 2.5 cars and 2.5 kids. No, right? What does God say here? Verse 2, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. In verse 3, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God doesn't want to just bless Israel for Israel's sake. He wants to bless his people who will then go on to bless all peoples of the earth. God's call for Abraham is the same call that God has had for his people throughout the Bible. The same calls in Genesis 1 when he blessed man and woman and called them to fill the earth and subdue it. The same call throughout the New Testament like Matthew chapter 28, Jesus calling the disciples to go and make disciples of the nations. Same call as in Acts chapter 1-8 to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Go and bless. Same calls in Revelations when we see the fulfillment of God's promise of blessing. When all the nations stand before the throne in worship of God, you and I have the purpose of blessing the nations. And thousands of years later, after Abraham, today, God's plan is still the same. To use you and me, Peach Tree Christian Church, to set out for Canaan, to bless nations like Mongolia, to bless people groups in Atlanta and to the ends of the earth. Do we believe this? I want to try something here this morning. It's a big church, but I think we can do it. If you can turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor, and I want you to say something. Turn to your neighbor and say, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth. All right, good. Some of you were like looking at your neighbor like, really, God? This person? Are you sure? Each of us has the purpose of blessing the nations. It's not an optional activity. It's not what one student came up to me once and said, is this like extra credit? You know? It's not extra credit. It's our purpose. We live in a world with unprecedented opportunities for blessing the nations. There's unprecedented communications and technology. iPhones and social media allow us to instantly connect from one side of the world to the other. The internet and satellite TV have opened the door of, to evangelism through a screen or a monitor. I was in Peru several years ago and I saw Amazonian Bible translators Skyping with American consultants in the U.S. There's unprecedented urbanization and unprecedented immigration, which has now relocated previously unreached people groups to urban centers like Atlanta, where they now can be reached with the gospel. But sadly, we still live in a world with unprecedented need for blessing the nations. We're seeing an unprecedented refugee crisis, and we're seeing 4 billion of the world, 7 billion people, over 3,000 people groups in the world that are either unreached or unchurched. They've never heard of this spiritual blessing. We're seeing previously church nations in Europe, now unchurched, atheist or Muslim. Many would say that Islam is now the number one religion in London and Paris. Many would say that North America is not doing much better. I'm a fan of Bible translation. I've served on the board of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Uh, what shocked me about this all is not that 1,800 languages of the world do not even have one verse of scripture. What shocked me is the biggest challenge for Bible translation is recruitment, trying to get God's covenant people to go and bless the nations. It's exactly as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10. How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they believe? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? When we were in Mongolia, we used to uh, meet this one pastor. His name's Inkbader. Uh, he was in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. On the weekdays, he would go to the countryside and preach the gospel. And so uh, he was telling us a story about one day he stopped by a local cafe. It's kind of like this hut where he'd have lunch. And this was his custom. He would 
asked to share a story with the owner, right? You would story the story of Jesus, right? So the owner said, okay, and they sat down. And as he began sharing, uh, the, the woman's tears began to flow from her eyes. She began to cry and cry. And Inkbotter asked her, what was wrong? She answered with this story. She said, a couple days earlier, before Inkbotter came to the cafe, she received a gospel tract from one of her customers. She read it, and she wanted to receive Jesus in her heart, but she didn't know how. And she thought, well, maybe if I ran up to the mountains, maybe Jesus would be there. So she went up to the mountains, and she cried out, Jesus, are you here? Jesus, are you here? No answer. She thought, wow, where is this Jesus? So she walked down the mountain that day, very disappointed, and then she had another idea. She thought, maybe Jesus is not in the mountains, maybe Jesus is in the fields. You know, Mongolia has a lot of fields. And so she runs up and down the fields, crying out, Jesus, are you here? Jesus, are you here? Still, no answer. Where is this Jesus that she read about? That day she went home very discouraged and confused, and as she was walking home, she just cried out in a prayer, Jesus, if you're real and you want me to enter your kingdom, please bring someone to explain your words to me. And then she looked up at Inkbotter and she said, Inkbotter, you are the answer to my prayers. Will you explain Jesus' words to me? They spent the rest of that day, Inkbotter explained the words of Jesus. She accepted Jesus into her life that day. God is good. Amen? But how can they hear without someone preaching to them? There are millions like Inkbotter's friend around the world, in countrysides and in our cities, on our college campuses, millions crying out, where is this Jesus? Jesus, are you here? God has blessed us to be a blessing to the nations. Are we as the church, blessed with resources and talents, blessing the nations? Why is it so challenging? Well, as I've been to many places around the world, I see our number one reason, number one challenge for us here is that our culture teaches us that blessing the world is only for the select few. Our culture teaches us that for the rest of us, we're supposed to do everything we can to bless ourselves, right? To avoid suffering, to avoid the nomadic life. Our families didn't say to us growing up, what I really want for you is to suffer for the nations, right? If your parents were like mine, or if what you say to your children perhaps, they taught me that my top goal in life should be work to work hard to attain a comfortable life instead of a suffering life. I was taught to attain a top Ivy League diploma in order to attain top jobs at top law firms and in order to attain a comfortable life. A white picket fence home with 2.5 cars and 2.5 kids. And I was doing pretty well on this track. I attained top honors at an Ivy League school. I attained some top jobs. I was on an ESPN television special with fame and followers. I chased the comfortable life until one day when it was finally within reach, I felt empty and purposeless. And then God challenged me with Genesis chapter 12. I have a mission for you, Tom, and I always have. I began to realize that all the blessings I had obtained in my life, all the accolades and honors, my education and experiences, all my talents were for a grander purpose, to bless the nations. But in Mongolia, there was nothing comfortable about it. There's nothing comfortable about learning a new language and culture. I remember having second graders come up to us each day just making fun of us, you know. There was nothing comfortable about being utterly lonely. Nancy and I would turn to each other some days and just say, honey, we have no friends, you know. There was nothing comfortable about dying to our own family as my parents cut off communication and did not support my commitment to missions. I love my parents. But when I first responded to God's call in my 20s, mom and dad argued with me profusely for days and days and days. They finally got down on their knees with their palms open saying, Tom, our lives are in the palm of your hands. Please don't crush us. And then mom effectively ended all our arguments when she said, if you do this, Tom, 
I will kill myself. They cut off communication for many years. My phone calls went unanswered. My letters were unreturned. And then seven years later, mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and we still had not reconciled. I remember crying out to God, why can't you make this easier, God? But God's purpose since creation has been that he wants his people to bless the nations, and it often requires leaving comfort. Certainly for Abraham, it wasn't comfortable. We go back in the story here in Genesis 12. He leaves his homeland. He leaves his comfortable living. He had the good life in Haran. It says there he was rich. It says in the scriptures, people they had acquired. Did you catch that? People they had acquired. It meant that he had servants. He was 75 years old. I mean, if anyone had an excuse not to go, it was Abraham. But in verse 4, Abraham goes to his Mongolia. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. Now verse 4, though simple, is the hinge verse in this entire passage. Abraham's story hinges on two words here. Abraham left, or went. Or in the Hebrew, it's Vayelik Abraham. Vayelik Abraham. Scholars agree that Vayelik Abraham isn't just the key to Abraham's story. It's also the key to the whole story of the Old Testament. Scholar Chris Wright concludes this. Bluntly put, if Abraham had not gotten up and left for Canaan, the story would have ended right there. Indeed, the, the Bible will very much be a thin book indeed. Vaelic Abraham, not because it was the comfortable thing to do, but because God asked him to get up and go. Now, it's important to note that even though Abraham went, even though he said yes to God, to trusting God, it's still not comfortable. If we actually count in Genesis chapters 12 and 13, Abraham moves and resides in at least eight different places. Chapter 12, verse 6, the land they're supposed to go to, Canaan, it turns out to be occupied. There are people already living there. To make matters worse, the Canaanites are pagans. It's a place where they turn women into temple prostitutes and sacrifice children to pagan gods. Verse 10, there's a great famine, and Abraham finds himself starving to death. And on top of all that, he has to give up his wife Sarah to Pharaoh and pretend to be Sarah's brother in order to survive. It's not comfortable. Blessing the nations isn't comfortable. God doesn't give comfortable callings to Abraham or to us. Where is your Mongolia, that people group, that place where God is leading you to get up and go? That might mean leaving comfort. Where is that arena of your everyday life? Maybe it's in the arts or the sciences or business or in your family that God wants to redeem and use to bless the world. An interesting thing happens when we leave comfort and bless the nations. And that is that we see God's faithfulness. We see this in Genesis chapter 13, which is the climax to Abraham's adventure. Let's look at Genesis 13 briefly. Verse 1, God's faithful in Abraham's marriage. It says, it says so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham's able to leave Egypt unscathed, and he reunites with his wife, Sarah. In verse 2, it says God's faithful in caring for their physical needs. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold, it says. And then finally, in verse 16, God's faithful in miraculously giving them generations of children. God says, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. Lots of children. When we bless the nations, God is faithful. And in all those difficult years of going and blessing the nations, I've seen God's faithfulness. He's been faithful in ministry. We got to see miracle after miracle in Mongolia. Uh, over 500 students coming to know the Lord in our first few years we were there. An indigenously led, Mongolian led movement now in place there. We get to see miracle after miracle in our work on U.S. campuses today. Just this past year in InterVarsity, we've seen the most conversions, the most people coming to Christ than ever in our 76-year history. 
faithful in blessing my marriage and my children, faithful in blessing my parents. Two months before my mom passed away, she called me home. With tears streaming down her cheeks, mom sat down next to me and she held my hand. And she said, Tom, there's something I've been wanting to say to you for a long time now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. All these years I should have supported you. Will you forgive me? Mom and I reconciled on that day. As those were words I had been yearning to hear for over seven years, and God gave them at that time. God is faithful. Amen? God has blessed us to be a blessing to the nations, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I want to conclude with three practical next steps for us for blessing the nations. We can do that beginning now. And the first is to go and get a taste short term. Get a taste short term, one to two weeks, one to two months. All of us can invest a short time in getting to know God's heart for the nations. There's lots of short term opportunities to unreached people groups in the Middle East and Central Asia, around the world that can match your professional skills, your interests, or your college major. You can use your business skills to help create jobs for women who are marginalized or abused in much of the world. You can use your teaching skills to educate them and to lift them out of suffering. Now, as a missionary family with kids, we love people who just came short term just to say, hey, can we babysit for you guys? That was the best gift we could have as a family. So those of you who are students in the room, you have maybe eight weeks of vacation during the summer, right? Many of us who are working folks, maybe two to six weeks of vacation in the summer. I often say, take a vacation that will bless the nations instead of going somewhere boring like Hawaii, you know? <laughs> a second step for us, is to read sacrificially and give sacrificially. This is something all of us can do. Read sacrificially and give sacrificially. Read and be informed. Spend a few extra minutes daily just reading about global issues. Use online resources, if you can Google this, Operation World. Operation World is a wonderful book and website to research the plight of the church in every country in the world. Research Bibleist people groups. And then after reading, Bless the nations by giving sacrificially to Bible translation efforts, to anti-human trafficking efforts, ministries that are serving the refugee crisis. Give sacrificially to your Peachtree Church missionaries. Donate, perhaps. Donate some art or buy some art that will support some university students going to Nepal this summer. They're going on a short-term mission trip to Nepal, and I believe there's an art exhibition advertised in your bulletin. Consider, how can I read or give sacrificially in order to bless the nations. Third step, and lastly, go locally and bless the nations that are arriving at our doorstep. International students, refugees, co-workers. Pastor J.D. Payne says this, something is missionally malignant if we make sacrifices to travel the world to reach people, but are unwilling to cross the street. You can bless the nations every day here in Atlanta by touching someone else's life with God's love. Consider local volunteer and mission opportunities that Peachtree is connected to. Consider volunteering with new refugees that are in your local neighborhoods. I know University would love to have volunteers that are serving on Atlanta campuses with us. Start genuine friendships with Muslim international students who are coming to the States in larger numbers than ever in our history. The number two sending country of international students today is India, and one of the fastest growing is Saudi Arabia. Let's not just address injustice or ethnic cleansing and war in North Africa, but let's address injustice and racism here in Atlanta, in our everyday. Go local and stand in solidarity with ethnic communities that are hurting and begin the hard work of reconciliation in our own backyards. Go local and pray for the nations. Get a group of friends and start a Bless the Nations prayer group. Pray daily for the majority world. Pray for the places where there is no church. I believe God has blessed Peachtree Christian tremendously. So my question again today is, 
Will you say yes to going to your Mongolia? Will you say yes to blessing the nations? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is consistent. From Genesis to Revelation, you call us to be a part of blessing the nations. Thank you for the privilege of taking part in your mission. And Lord, as we leave this place today, I pray for wisdom and courage to take steps, next steps necessary, Lord, to be a part of this. May we hear your voice. May we see the needs around us. And may we say yes to taking those steps to bless those around us and to bless the nations. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.